At the time of me recording this video, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker has been out for nearly 5 months and fans are still divided on how the saga ended. One of the contributing factors to this is the lack of answers given to many of the questions throughout the trilogy, or just how those answers were handled. In the Rise of Skywalker Visual Dictionary we get some answers and some new facts and I thought I should make a video to talk about the information given and how it fits into the overall story. Some of these facts may not actually have been first given to us in the Visual Dictionary but I have learned them from it and I found it interesting enough to put in the video. Here is a full list of the different topics and here are the timestamps of them. First up, we have the planets and locations from The Rise of Skywalker. Adria Claus is located here on the galaxy map nearby Daphomir and Dantooine and it was scouted for the Rebel Alliance during the Galactic Civil War. We learn that the old Rebel Alliance avoided settling on planets with indigenous life to avoid bringing the Empire to the civilizations on it. The planet has signs that it once was life but for some unknown reasons they are no longer around. The Resistance refers to this species as the Kloss. It is also the planet where Luke trained Leia in that flashback sequence. We return to the fiery planet of Mustafar, where we find out that the people protecting the Wayfinder at the beginning of the film are actually Sith cultists, and the location Kylo Ren and the First Order decimate is located nearby Vader's castle. The cultists are grown and gathered from the legends and infamous stories of Darth Vader and his castle. The cultists do not allow Kylo Ren access, hence why he kills them all. We learn some information about the Sith worlds of the Star Wars universe, mainly that Exegol happens to be the oldest Sith world to exist, and Moraband was once known as Korriban, its original name in Legends, but it is said that many worlds have different names, hence why the change in canon to Moraband. Other Sith planets include Malakor, Zeost, Jaguda, and Relg. I don't know if I said those right, but I did my best. And some worlds have had their Sith culture completely wiped from the planet. One fact that we learn about Kojimi is that it is heavily implied that the character called Rothgar Deng is actually the bounty hunter Dengar. He is described as an old and experienced Corellian bounty hunter who is likely operating under an alias. Rothgar Deng, minus a few letters, is an anagram for Dengar. He has given himself cybernetic replacements in the poor attempts to live and work forever and the reason that he looks so different is that he got old and his skills got worse and he took to a black market surgeon to give himself replaced wizened body parts and it led to his ghastly and oddly weird look. The Death Star crashing into Kefbir should have wiped out the entire planet but didn't and it's labelled as a mystery. The ruins of the Death Star are so large that they actually shape the moon's climate and has created a whole new ecosystem for the moon. And Rey is reminded of her time on Jakku scavenging old Imperial Star Destroyers by all the desolated TIE fighters and Stormtrooper armour on the Death Star. The idea of a sunken Death Star was initially supposed to be used in the original script for The Force Awakens. I think it was supposed to be underwater and it was supposed to be used for some imperial plans or something like that. A few things we learn about the resistance is we get the backstories on characters such as Snap Wexley who we actually find out is the stepson of Wedge Antilles and everything he learned about piloting he learned from him which is a bit of a weird thing when Snap dies at the end of the film and it's never really mentioned with Wedge when he turns up at the battle we never really get any resolve to that or mention of anything to it so it's a bit of a weird fact. Uh, we learn that the medal Chewie gets at the end of the film is actually hands from a new hope. We learn that Rey used force heal on Luke's saber which she used to reconnect the two parts together with a new strap in the middle and she learned all this from the Jedi text hence why she can suddenly force heal. The training helmet that she uses which is also seen in the Luke and Leia flashback scene is actually a repurposed A-wing helmet and it's sort of been uh, handcrafted into a Jedi visor. And we learn that R2-D2 has scanned all the Jedi texts so that if anything did happen to them, like Luke thought happened in The Last Jedi, then there's no problem there and R2 can just sort of whip him out again. Finn has grown his hair out in a rebellious effort to break away from old First Order regulations. Poe has been teaching him about piloting, which is a callback to how Finn didn't know how to pilot a TIE fighter in The Force Awakens. Finn is actually pretty important to the Resistance as his former Stormtrooper training gives them lots of different information on the First Order and their tactics. In the last year, Finn has been pushing all of his boundaries and learning more about leadership, languages and other areas, and has taken more of an interest in the Force. This basically further confirms that he is indeed Force sensitive. Another hint to this is possibly his favour of one-handed weapons uncommon for Stormtroopers, and as we all know, lightsabers are more one-handed than double-bladed, so that could just be a little reference or it could be nothing. The character of Beaumont's kin, played by Dominic Monaghan, it's a bit like the Star Wars equivalent of Indiana Jones. He's a professor of history and an explorer. 
He joined the, the resistance after predicting the destruction of the Hosnian system and became captain of the, of the intelligence division. He has a massive interest and knowledge in Sith history, which probably would have been more useful with all the Palpatine and Exegol and Sith Eternal stuff, but, you know, hey-ho. And he has visited the planets Malachor, Moribad, Deveron to research ancient Jedi and Sith conflicts. He helped Rey translate the several languages of Jedi texts, and he keeps notes of the Jedi texts on him just for research. And He's a character who I think would have been a lot more fun to have in the film, and he could have been a useful side character to have go with them on their journeys, but for whatever reason they didn't do that. And I think it's a bit of a missed opportunity for the character and the actor in the film. We learn that Maz Kanata helped Leia get her bounty hunter disguise, the one that she wears to Jabba's palace in the start of Return of the Jedi. And the Jungle X Hopper is a custom vehicle built by Rose Tico, made up of the frame of an X-Wing cockpit and several other parts, which I think looks like quite a cool vehicle, to be honest. Rose helped develop modification to hyperdrive systems, which make it harder for the First Order to track them which is a nice bit of character development from her character in The Last Jedi, but unfortunately it's not a thing that ever really gets brought up or anything like that, so it's a bit of a shame for her character, to be honest. Most members of the Resistance live on board the Tantive Four and all go through combat training to make sure that everyone can do their part in the battle against the First Order. It is implied that the kidnapping of Lando's child is what led to his exile on Pasana, as the effort and the strain of not being able to find her was too much for him. And it is even more implied that Janna is actually Lando's daughter, as she was kidnapped by the First Order just like his daughter was. We learn that the First Order were trying to strike at the old Rebel Alliance leadership, possibly hinting at why the Resistance allies did not come to their aid in The Last Jedi. Lando's yacht, the Lady Luck, is also from Legends, although it has a different design to what is mentioned in canon at the moment. Lando's full name is Baron Landonis Balthazar Calrissian. Lando tells the tales of his unfinished Calrissian Chronicles to the children of the Aki Aki, the chronicles that he was writing in Solo. And Lando aided Luke in his search for the Sith remnants six years after the disappearance of his daughter, so shortly before he landed on Pasana, looking for Ochi of Bestoon. Kylo Ren remakes the helmet which he broke in The Last Jedi to have his own style with the glowing Sith alchemy showing. And also, Kylo Ren's new ship is a new First Order TIE fighter called the TIE Whisper, which is actually something I didn't notice in the film, I just assumed he was still using the TIE Silencer. General Armitage Hux hates Knights of Ren because of their savage lifestyles and their dirty nature. He hates the way they drag mud and dirt through the nice, tidy and clean First Order hallways. Allegiant General Pride has been waiting for decades to put an authoritarian grip on the galaxy. He doesn't care about the mysticism and the macabre of the Sith, he just sees them as a means to control the galaxy, and in his Imperial days, he actually witnessed Vader in action. I don't know what that could possibly be referring to, but I hope it's a story we one day see. Whether in a film or a comic or a book, I think that would be quite cool. Especially because Pride is such an interesting character in that film where we find out he actually served the Emperor during the Imperial days. And it's just a shame he's not a character we recognise, otherwise that would hold a lot of weight to it. So I'd like to see how they continue to tell his story from the Imperial days up until his time in the First Order. A Wayfinder is used to find ways to tricky worlds such as Ilum and Rakata Prime. The Sith Wayfinder is never actually used to guide to specific Dark Side worlds. And Luke's Jedi Compass from Battlefront 2, which we get a sneak peek at in The Last Jedi, was used to find Act 2. Stormtroopers re-emerged five years before the destruction of the New Republic and were presented as a territorial protection force. The higher-ups of the First Order were Imperial veterans and are slowly replaced by younger, fanatical loyalists. Not something we learn in the Visual Dictionary, but a theory I've seen on Ochi of Bastoon is that looking at the shape and the possible markings of Ochi's skull, there is a chance that he could be the template for Snoke. While Snoke doesn't look that similar to Ochi, it could be due to the fact that it's a different form of cloning and not as pure as the Kaminoan form of cloning. And that is why Snoke's face is so broken and missing chunks. And finally we have reached behind the scenes and just facts that I didn't know really where to slide in so I thought I'd put them here at the end. The design for the Hermit character was initially supposed to be separate from Lando and started off as a potential bounty hunter and was designed to be cowboy themed and kept the cinematic western roots in play. 
The costumes for the Resistance soldiers were designed to fit the jungle-themed planet, which would end up becoming Adrian Kloss, and the designs drew inspiration from Joe Johnston and Rodis Gemero's original design for the Endor Rebels in Return of the Jedi. Finn would ditch the borrowed jacket from the last two films and get a new poncho look to fit the new environment in this artwork shown by Glenn Dillon. Ray's original look for the film is similar to her final look, but with differences. It is described as a blend of Jedi heritage, scavenger origins, and a touch of Alderinian nobility to show Leia's influence on her. Poe was originally to pilot a Y-Wing and would get a new helmet, and his outfit seemed to be a mix of his Nathan Drake-style outfit and his pilot uniform. Reaching the lava facts to finish off the video, we have the new timeline being confirmed as BSI to ASI, standing for Before Starkiller Incident and After Starkiller Incident. It is confirmed that Elam is the planet that Starkiller Base ended up becoming, and it is called a terraforming project. It is confirmed that Palpatine was searching for immortality during his time in the Empire. The star that the remnants of Starkiller Base ended up becoming was nicknamed the Solo, after the fallen legend Han Solo. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe, and make sure you leave a comment on topics you would like to see in the future. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for future content.